What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Brian. How you doing today, Brian? I'm real good. How you doing, Dan? I'm fantastic because my very favorite audience member is here today. And why is my favorite audience member here today? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate syndicators, investors, buyers, sellers, all that kind of stuff. And why would I do such a silly thing? Well, part of it is because most of the deals that are out there, they're private deals, they're off market deals. And the only way that people are legally allowed to share them with you is if you have a prior substantive relationship that's documented for the SEC and all that kind of stuff. So I got to make sure I meet everybody and then I have a nice record to show that I checked them out, found out their level of sophistication, appetite for risk, core companies, and that sort of thing. So the exciting thing for you is because of the DanDoesDeals.com commercial competency cube, you will learn how to effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate deals and you'll also know how my guest fits in. But before we get too excited about that, uh, uh, Brian, do you want to say a couple things to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Brian Blackburn. I live in the Chalfont, uh, I'm sorry, Philadelphia area. I invest in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Been doing this since 2019. Have uh, 111 doors between uh, two MSAs, 30 in Charlotte and 81 in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, done uh, multi uh, single family for 30 years, self-managed. And I am so done with that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That makes lots of sense. So the first section, the first segment that I have, it's the motivations part. Before I get to that, I often like to say, but wait, check your eight. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have the uncanny ability to look through your camera and into the audience's device, but there might be a huge, this hideous red button that says subscribe and they should really hit that because it's free and it's better. No, nah, it's just a joke. I always do. <laughs> anyway, so the five distinct motivations, I've talked to a whole whack of syndicators, investors, and all that kind of stuff. And I found at the end of the day, everybody has their own version of the rules, but it's some sort of variation of these five. And I need to know which one of them or what combination of them really describes my guest best because making a commercial acquisition, it's a long process and it's not simple and there are lots of ways to go wrong. So I got to make sure that people will go through with it. So the okay. first motivation I've found from some people is preservation of purchasing power. And what that means is if somebody already has a portfolio of assets and they use the ownership, the proceeds from ownership to make ends meet, then this is who I'm describing. And the only time that they're going to make a new acquisition is when either inflation rears its ugly head and it takes a chunk out of your purchasing power. Again, you're not going to be selling assets because that's bad news. But the other option would be if there's a crash and you can get the assets at a discount, that's the other time when people like this would make the jump. But that's not me. My priority is trading time directly for wealth. And that's because of my background in technology. Whenever you are a high wage earner, high salary earner, anything like that, you're paying more in tax than anybody else. And when I realized that, it hit me that I should pivot into something where I'm rewarded in the form of deployed capital, aka equity. And that's why I'm involved in commercial real estate. But many people are finding commercial real estate appealing because they want to control their schedule. 
And that comes in a few different forms. Maybe they just want to actually fast track their retirement, or maybe they want to work fewer months per year, fewer weeks per month, who knows what it is. But uh, this is what is very appealing to some people. But there are a couple others that are quite different. Like the people who are just plain ambitious. They want to buy their entire hometown. They want their name on big skyscrapers or whatever it is. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. And that is why they're hustling like crazy. And the neat thing about that is they're probably going to keep on doing it into their 90s. So that's fantastic. But the last group, they're also similarly motivated but it's not necessarily just themselves or their family. They've found a sector of society, or maybe it's the environment, or maybe it's animals, who knows what it is, but they want to make a big splash. And the only way you're going to be pulling that off is if you have a substantial financial backing. So that's why some people are making these acquisitions. So Brian, as far as you go, uh, what combination of those motivations describe you best? Uh, The second one you mentioned, I think that's probably... 90% 90% of why I'm doing, I come up, I come from a business background and I see this as a business that you don't have to have hands on constantly. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. That's fantastic. So my next question though, uh, it has to do with tolerance for risk. And sometimes we have newbies on this show and maybe they've just heard that there's money in commercial real estate, but there's also a lot of risk involved. It's not that simple. It's simple enough that there's a ton of competition. So the thing I need to make sure before people dive in head first is that they have some sort of respect for the risks involved. And I I do that with this fill in the blank question. There are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. What's too risky for you, Brian? It can be real estate or otherwise. Me personally, I think industrial is mm-hmm. way too risky. Mm-hmm. I come from the industrial background. I've seen th- what people do when they rent properties and it's not something I choose. I think it's way too risky. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I've, I've heard that before where uh, uh, people want to stay away from industrial because the players are, have such deep pockets and such great underwriting that they know if somebody is, you know, basically uh, giving themselves a bad deal. So there's some mm-hmm. predatory uh, actions in there. Is, 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 that, uh, is that where you're coming from or you want to say a word or two about it? Uh, no, what I've seen is people... The, the, on the forefront, pollution. That's my big thing. I've seen people, because it's not their property, um, like batteries, mm-hmm. oil, antifreeze, mm-hmm. things like that. Anything involved in the industrial process, mm-hmm. because they don't own the property, they aren't as, what would be the good word? They aren't uh, great stewards of the land. Right, there you go. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I know they're, they're eventually held responsible, but, you know. It's a lot of pollution. Everyone, everyone gets to get a lawyer, and it's just. No. Time consuming and expensive. Is that something I choose to uh, get involved with? Perfect. Perfect. Great answer. So the next segment, it has to do with the Dan Does Deals Core Competency Cube. You can go to dandoesdeals.com, print out your own copy, and learn how to express yourself about commercial real estate effectively. And that's why I want you to do it. That's why I don't even ask for your email address. It's totally free and all that kind of stuff at dandoesdeals.com. But in every episode of Chance Encounters, I go through all six sides just to make sure that you understand where my guest fits into these deals. And I start off with repositioners because they are acquisitions people. They look at a lot of different properties and they do a bunch of paperwork. What is it that they do with that paperwork, you may ask? Well, there's a fancy word for it. It's called underwriting. It means they're (laughs) doing the math. They're making the assumptions, figuring out what's the plan here for taking over this business. But part of doing that math is to figure out, is the broker or seller even telling the truth about how much this property is making? Because that's enormous. Now, when they're doing the underwriting, though, they're looking for upside. They're finding more ways to make the, the building, the property more profitable. And the first place they're going to look is to try and find more advantageous lending from financiers. Now, financiers are people who only deal with money and paper. Okay, they There may be repositioners, like pretty much every repositioner out there will have some sort of investor relations. Uh, but uh, the financiers, if they aren't doing any work whatsoever, they'd either be a limited partner or they uh, would not at least be on the GP team. Uh, so 
financiers, if you get a better loan, that's more upside all baked in. But the next place the repositioner will look will be the operations. They're going to figure out how to stop those Benjamins from going down the toilet. And now, of course, some syndicators, like once you get to like 100 units or more, it's pretty common for people to outsource their operations. And then you're thinking of a true repositioner move if you're going to be uh, making more upside that way. But uh, me personally, my, my backup, uh, my contribution to operations would have to do with marketing and automation so that's what uh, that's how i contribute but operations it's not the best place to look for finding that real upside the better place that repositioners often especially when they're getting started or uh, you know like when they don't have a huge uh, nest egg to work with the repositioner will often look to a contractor team to improve the property to find that upside so if you make these units nicer the next tenant will be happy to pay more in rent than the previous one as long as there's strong demographics right but speaking of demographics there's one issue that you're going to have with the fact that contracting is so expensive if you are like me and you're from the internet you're definitely going to need locals you're going to need boots on the ground who can be there in an hour or two because that's most certainly not going to be me okay mm -hmm. i would be stuck at an airport in an hour or two so that's not going to be it but when the repositioner has assembled this team and found a property that they really really like they're going to turn around to the banks and financiers and say hey i got this great property and it's tens of millions of dollars you don't happen to have say tens of millions of dollars you want to lend us do you and the financier is going to have one burning question in their mind that has to be answered before they'll say yes, which is, who's your sponsor, KP? And in a lot of coaching programs, they gloss over the sponsor KP part, and that's probably because the coach wants to be your sponsor KP. <laughs> but <laughs> the, what a sponsor KP is it's to make you eligible for a commercial loan and to be eligible for a commercial loan you need somebody in the fold who already owns a similar asset so if you want to take over a 350 unit apartment complex with your friends you're going to need somebody in the fold who already owns a 350 unit complex and then on top of that you might need somebody who comes in just to supply a balance sheet which is also a term for kp but the ownership team they have to have a balance sheet worth at least the amount of the loan and you need a certain amount of liquidity but if you got all those pieces you got yourself a commercial real estate deal so brian as far as your core competencies go uh where do you see yourself uh in your team contributing to your deal specifically uh i did you have a contractors on there yes i did there yeah you. i think with my with my background i i see a lot of uh people not understanding the intricacies of of you know, the HVAC units, the electrical, all that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that's second nature to me. So I, I really see uh, cost savings in that area because it's all about thinking outside the box. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's really powerful and a value add. Did you have more to add or you want to move on? Well, we move on. That's good. Okay, cool. So the next step then has to do with buy box. Okay. And when commercial syndicators or investors are talking to each other and saying, hey, what's your ideal property look like? They're really talking about three things. First one's geography, which states, which counties, which neighborhood. Okay. It could all matter. Okay. Geography's first. Second one is the size of the deal. We're talking mostly about multifamily here. So we're going to be using unit count and the size matters because you're going to have a different type of group of people taking over 15 unit apartment complexes from the ones that are doing 350 unit apartment complexes. So that size matters in industrial, you use square footage instead, but, uh, but that's how we figure it out in these types of, uh, commercial real estate. But the third one is called class. And unfortunately, they use the same word for two different things quite often. And the first meaning of class has to do with the condition of the building. So is it old or is it up to date? Is it beat up or is it in reasonably good shape? Is it no frills or is it full of amenities and all sorts of luxuries? That's the first meaning. The second meaning is also sometimes called area, which makes more sense. But what they're talking about when they're talking about the area, it's like the crime rate where the property is located and the school districts. That's, that's the second meaning of class. But both of those two are ranked in the same strategy, the same system as in grade school where it's 
A plus, A, A minus, B plus, and so on. So Brian, as far as you and your team goes, uh, what's easier to say yes to and more difficult to say no to? I don't understand the question, sorry. The buy box, <laughs> just the buy box. What's your buy box as far as geography, size, oh. and, uh, and class? Okay, the, um, the geography, it would be um, North Carolina. I love North Carolina. Mm -hmm. If I uh, a perfect a perfect uh, spot for me would be Charlotte, although it's uh, a tough market to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like Charlotte. I like C class properties and B class properties. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the um, with all the new construction coming online this year, I think C class is really going to be um, more stable than B and A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was the third? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just the area. So you, you covered it in your in your class anyway. So okay, know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Beautiful, and especially because you're doing value adds. So it makes lots of sense to get like a C class property in a B area, so the upgrade will be able to support it. So that's correct. Excellent. Yep. excellent, excellent. So then the next part has to do with who you are disproportionately well suited to help. We've got these different sides of the die, six different roles. Nobody is going to be all six sides for any meaningful amount of time, especially if it's, you know, like a real commercial deal with a lot of units, right? But even though that's the case, we all love giving referrals, building new teams, being super duper helpful. It's actually quite weird because it made me super suspicious at first, to be totally honest. But at the same time, because of our own unique skill sets, we are disproportionately well suited to help some people more than others. Me personally, it's always the sponsor KPs, just because they've got the foundations for a guy with heavy duty marketing, social media, automation skills and stuff like that, like me. So those are the ones who I'm most eager to talk to. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have any 506B raises going on right now. If you do, you're not supposed to entice investors. So make sure you don't have any candies or pastries or something that you show on the camera because that's very enticing, right? But uh, uh, it, you can still say beginners. Uh, it sounds to me like you'd be well suited to uh, meet a lot of repositioners to really amplify your contractor side. Uh, and you can still say beginners or whatever, but um, just don't entice any investors if you got a B deal. So, so yeah, no, no, who do you want to help? I'd like to help um, beginners, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, Cut me off guard here. <laughs> it happens. It happens. Yeah. And, yeah. and I did mention the repositioners. So the more repositioners you have in North Carolina, I'm sure that would be uh, really beneficial oh, yeah. for you. You yeah. know, yeah. get uh, get more deal flow to really amplify your uh, contractor skills. Uh, does that about cover it? Or you just, well, I guess you could yeah. also say just, yeah, everybody reach out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think those two cover it. They're really good. Beautiful, beautiful. And then as far as how to get a hold of you and uh, see, for me personally, I got a distinct last name, so it should be there on your screen right there. I'm easy to find. LinkedIn is the social media platform where I spend the most time, and that's the best way to reach me. This code, this QR code here, if you scan it with your phone, that'll bring you to the FAQs page of 506BME, where I offer to be your chief compliance officer starting at $497 per year. So it's a really, really great deal to get that part buttoned up for your SEC compliance. But Brian, if people want to reach out to you, is it a social media platform or website, phone? How, how should people reach out? The best way would be through LinkedIn. It's Brian Blackburn on LinkedIn. I think it's the best way to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Just, you reach out and do a PM and it's all good. <laughs> all right. Excellent. That's really, really exciting. And so then the last thing, uh, it's actually not for you, Brian, it's for you in the audience, which is if you have been watching this episode and you're like, I don't know what's wrong with my eyeballs. It's like fire and like laser beams, like, like migraines. It's probably because of the that really terrible red button that says mm -hmm. subscribe and you really should hit it. It's free, which is amazing. It makes all those awful, mm, it makes all that stuff stop. And most importantly for me anyway, it means that YouTube might start paying for these videos instead of me, which would be totally amazing. And all it means is that my videos may show up in your list of suggestions. You can completely ignore those suggestions because I just appreciate the fact that you spent this time with me. Just like Brian, I appreciate you spending the time with me. It's been oh, great getting to I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Awesome. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey. Yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just hold it right in the 
square there. Okay, cool. And now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay. Are you already logged into 506 BB? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list. So when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 BB, everybody.